Hello, hello, hello. Welcome or welcome back. I am so excited to finally be filming this video for like hopefully the final time. I tried to film this video two other times in the past couple days, which is why this is going up a little bit later than I normally would. I've been wanting to film this video forever, but I've just been feeling so like physically exhausted. We have had Taylor Swift's The Tortured Poets Department and the anthology extended version of it for a little while now. You know, it's been able to settle and sit and kind of start to make its home within our brains. I know I'm still very much in the honeymoon phase um, with this album. So like listening to it and discovering new things and like making new connections with all of the tracks, but definitely doing this lyrical analysis, which is what we're going to be doing today, really like like deepened that and like furthered my appreciation for a lot of these songs. So today we are going to be doing a deep dive lyrical analysis into the first chunk of the Tortured Poets Department. So just the original album, the white album, the Tortured Poets Department that starts with Fortnite and ends with Clara Bow. We are going to be going song by song, analyzing these lyrics kind of as if they were poetry. You know, Taylor Swift's lyrics have always read really well as poetry, um, but this album specifically, just because it doesn't always have the consistency of the like verse, pre-chorus, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, end, um, like the very Max Martin pop formula song, like all the songs we saw on 1989 were, which are fantastic and great, but these really read more as stanzas than like repeated choruses and verses. You can see that in there definitely, but they read really, really, really well as poetry. And one thing you might not know about me was that poetry and literary analysis, I don't want to like teach the children how to do it or whatever. I just want to be handed a paper of lyrics and be told to analyze it for all of the word choices and the literary devices that are used and the imagery that's created and just all of the little nuances of the writing and the choices that were made. And so I went through each and every one of the songs in the Tortured Poets Department and I annotated and analyzed them with a set of glitter gel pens that I bought specifically for this. And now we are going to go through my findings. Please keep in mind while we are doing this that this is just one girly, one Swifties thoughts and opinions and interactions with going through these songs, um, like kind of like line by line and listening to them after and incorporating the sonic elements and how they like kind of click in with the lyrics and the theme and the vibe created by the song. Um, each song is a piece just like a poem. It's something that has been pieced together from all of these little threads and all of these little bits. Her voice, the way she chooses to vocalize things, the words she chooses in her writing, the order in which she puts things, the cadence and the tempo with which she puts to certain lines and not others, when backup singers are introduced, the music behind it, when it changes and when it doesn't, the melody. So many things go into a song and so that is why there is so much to say about each and every one of these individual pieces. So I I am a Swifty and this is just me delving into the work of my favorite artist and finding ways to interact with it on a deeper level. I do not know her, I do not know her life, and it is not my place to be judging um, or making definitive claims about her life, choices, decisions, etc. So anything that I say or talk about in this is just a little the Lulu Swifty talking about the possibilities and threads that could be connected between these lyrics and other ones in the Taylor universe. This is not about Taylor personally, this is just a fan interacting with her work on a judgment free level. Again, I do not know her and her life and her choices and that's really none of my business as a fan. Um, my business is the work that she gives us and the way that she interacts with us through it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here. If you want a more expanded uh, version of that disclaimer, feel free to check out this video. I'll link it in the description and I'll put a card for it right here about how we are discussing this album and the dynamic that we as Swifties and non-Swifties have kind of created with with Taylor Swift and talking about her and her music and like this album in particular and just the kind of whole cloud of um, that's happened just with the drop of this album and the lead up to it and such. So um, if you'd like an extended disclaimer, feel free to check that out. But without further ado, let's get into a lyrical analysis of the Tortured Poets Department.
jumping right into it with Fortnite. Fortnite is how this album opens and like I feel like the more people have sat with it um, I'm going to be looking down at my notes kind of periodically so forgive me for that I just like I needed to do it this way so that I could like I could draw the arrows and like go through it line by line you know it's just it's necessary for my brain but I feel like people were very a little bit like trying to figure out why this was the opener and why it was the first single and I feel like the really easy answer to that is is because like it's the one Post Malone is featured on. Um, but I don't know, by the end of this um, and like really going through it and listening, I feel like I understand why this was the first single and why this was the opener. So after we talk about it, let me know if you feel similarly. So it opens and it kind of sonically sounds like a live thing. It sounds like an a startup like something is tuning in something is starting and then the first line is I was supposed to be sent away but they forgot to come and get me she's so good at packing a punch with few words because the way the words are phrased and the words that are chosen deliver a full story or a full image and that's going to be the case with a lot of these lyrics that is what Taylor Swift is so incredibly good at and I feel like that's what makes a good writer which is why people are always saying Taylor Swift is such a good writer and if you didn't quite understand that then maybe this will help you because this is not even something that people are saying it's her best work ever um but it is very writing heavy like the focus of this album was very much the lyrics and the writing which is why I think the tortured poets department is the perfect title for it um but I digressed I was supposed to be sent away but they forgot to come and get me this gives such a vibe of neglect and being forgettable being crazy and having something wrong with you but you're not crazy enough to where they didn't miss your name on the list and they didn't forget to come and get you. Um, you weren't crazy enough to where you weren't still forgotten. And I feel like on this album, there are a lot of themes of being forgotten and being there like shining and wanting or even in distress and just being completely misunderstood or neglected or even like the feeling of being abandoned and ghosted and forgotten and just being left in that having being forgotten is very much present on this album. The next line however really befuddles me and I feel like a lot of people <laughs> have been just talking about this line and then letting it lie. I was a functioning alcoholic till nobody noticed my new aesthetic. I was a functioning alcoholic and then there's like this little keys sound until nobody noticed my new aesthetic. And then that's the first time Posty sings. So the way this line is formatted is very, very weird. And I understand sometimes that sentences are formed the way they are in order to fit the music or sometimes just because it sounds good and just because I know Taylor definitely does that. As intentional as she is sometimes, she also definitely is just like, that sounds dope. Um, I think, which is why I think it's crazy that sometimes Swifties, um, and like I said, I do this with like Delulu um, wonderings and like just musings sometimes, but like take every single word and are like, and that's that, and that's that, and that's that. And it could be, and that would be really cool and like mastermindy, but also that just could have sounded good and the syllables really clicked into the beat. Um, and so we went with that. But anyway, I was a functioning alcoholic until nobody noticed her new aesthetic. Was the new aesthetic the functioning alcoholicness? So, and it makes it seem that this guy that she's talking about, this neighbor that we later find out, um, is like the subject of this song. That's the person who noticed her new aesthetic. And when somebody noticed her new aesthetic, when nobody did, but then somebody did, that's what stopped the functioning alcoholic. So that changed things. And it makes it's giving the folklore ever more trapped inside, barricaded in the bathroom with a bottle of wine. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Drinking, staring at the gray skies. I hate it here going into your head. And then, and nobody thought anything of that, but somebody did notice it and say, this isn't you. And that made a change. That's just how I interpret that line. It's really like troubled me because I was a functioning alcoholic and nobody noticed my new aesthetic. Nobody noticed that about me and that was upsetting makes more sense but the till I think is the key there and all of this to say I hope you're okay but you're the reason what a goddamn breakup line that's literally that's the first thing I wrote when I underlined this and I find it so interesting when I like first heard this song I didn't even think to be like you're the reason for what it was very clear that the reason for her pain <laughs> her turmoil and like whatever that was she was going to either detail 
in this song or further on the album. That's another sign I feel like of good writing is when you kind of finish the sentence and the picture yourself mentally without even realizing that you've done it because the pieces that they've given you are so key that you know what the rest is. And Taylor Swift is so good at using things that click in with something that you already recognize and know so that you're able to fill in the rest of the picture yourself. So I hope you're okay. I'm acknowledging that we're both hurting here, but you're the reason for something. We're blaming someone here. But then the next line is, and that's what's interesting, the next line is, and no one here is to blame. But what about your quiet treason? I hope you're okay, but you're the reason, and no one here's to blame are opposites, are absolute opposites. And I feel like the no one here's to blame is um this song, we're just in the first like part, but this song becomes very much like a suburban, calm, serene American dream kind of mindset with like sadness and turmoil going on underneath that's just really kind of being smoothed over and I feel like the phrase well no one here's to blame is very and even how I just said it like that's how you say well no one here's to blame when you if you picked into it there might be some responsibility and stuff and some choices made and some emotions but that's far too complicated and so we're just gonna say you know what everyone's good no one here's to blame that's very diplomatic when you're just trying to end things and smooth them over um but what about your quiet treason now here's the thing his quiet treason towards her or his wife that we find out that he's cheating on is his treason towards her for abandoning what they had or towards his wife for quietly still having this little connection with her that she thinks is still slightly alive, but she's not sure because they were only together for a fortnight and now they just run into each other as neighbors. Who do you think the treason is towards? Or could it be both? Because that's also, Taylor Swift is fantastic at the double entendre, what about both meanings, um, game. I also think the phrase quiet treason is interesting because it reminds me a lot of In So Long London holding tight to your quiet resentment. And there's a lot of in this album, and this is another theme. I feel like the themes in this song really mirror the themes in this album really well. And if you delve into it, it seems to carry them all. I feel like there is the quiet resentment in So Long London, but also the the ghosting element and the just the silent betrayal the absence or the lack of something being what the betrayal is or the unspoken the unknown being what the betrayal is it makes me think of the was any of it real who the fuck was that guy in smallest man who ever lived there's very much a like what is wrong is not spoken it's like the absence is what's spoken and i feel like what about your quiet treason is another thematic line um, that kind of fits with this album and the themes in it really well. For a fortnight, there we were. We were together for two weeks, forever running to you. You're always trying to get away from your day. You're always trying to like go to that like heaven that you two have being together. Or it could really be this like destiny thing. And that's another really big theme on this album, destiny, like forever running towards what we were meant to be, forever running towards fate. Um, I also think it's interesting when I first heard this song, I heard forever run into you, sometimes ask about the weather, which is the next line. And so the fact that it sounds like forever running to you and run into you, running to you is very intentional and very like, this is what I want. We're going, we are on a path that cannot be deviated running to you, but run into you is very like accidental. Um, see you at the mailbox, which she talks about later. Sometimes ask about the weather. Um, same with like the mailbox line. That's a very like the epitome of small talk and just that flavor of suburban politeness um that you do with people that you might not have any like real relationship with or any desire to have like any depth of conversation but you do those niceties um the mailbox and asking about the weather are very much symbols of that at least to me because the mailbox is where you see people 
who you live around and that's where you make that small talk and you ask about the weather now you're in my backyard and all I picture there is just like the most uncomfy baby shower or like the most uncomfy like barbecue or like girl scout meeting or whatever that you like have in your neighbor's backyard and like you're there for you know the kids or the topic of the party or whatever but like you are only thinking about the uncomfortableness of you and that person um and you slept together and now they're in your backyard at a party that you and your partner are hosting like god ah we already have so much of a picture and the song's like barely started turned into good neighbors your wife waters flowers i want to kill so you talk her. about the weather that's the only like safe thing that you can like chit chat about when you do have to see each other and you've turned into good neighbors and what a perfect desperate housewives stepford wives scene that we've created the wife watering flowers because you only have time to garden and water flowers when you are interested in making your domestic life look pretty you know that's a very visual um leisurely thing you have the time to do it because you have leisure time and you have a place that is yours that you want to beautify and then you want to do something that's gardening growing flowers that takes a lot of time and intensive care and effort um and it's very specific and so she's watering flowers she's perfect and she wants to kill her because she wants that man so just with all of these it's never husband has never been said affair has never been said but we now see that they are in this situation and I feel like I've seen so many of these tiny little interactions that they've had um I mean she hasn't said the mailbox line yet I don't think no that's later but I feel like I've seen all these tiny little painful interactions that they've like had to have and just feel that like painful gravity. Also, people make fun of the like your wife waters flowers I want to kill her line um it's just a very classic like Stepford Wives like image like looking out the window at like the person that you want and like their wife and like just imagining stabbing that woman in the back as she's like bending over like watering flowers that's like a very classic image and Taylor Swift is very good at playing with classic archetypes and images she does so on this album a few times which we will talk about later um it's fun and it made me happy really any opportunity to take shots at Taylor Swift for being like a millennial people will um but like I'm also a millennial and I'm on board with her so all my mornings are Mondays stuck in an endless February Mondays are the worst morning of the week and you're like disappointed by like the idea of something being a Monday, like every morning being a Monday, is you're like disappointed by what you wake up to. Like it's a very gray mood and you have trouble like getting yourself up and into it because what you're looking forward to is a whole week and you're like, I don't want to, this is too much. Like I don't want to do this. And so it's like entering into something undesirable after something desirable so like would he be the weekend and then like returning to her normal life is like well every day is a Monday now because I don't want like it's just what I don't want ahead of me I have nothing to look forward to because you are my weekend and I can't have you stuck in an endless February very is a very gray dreary um like wintry month but also it, it did occur to me February is when so I thought that it was just like the the weather um which is very much like the weather in the uk actually just like gray and dreary um like i could definitely see someone who lives in the uk saying that they lived in an endless february um because the weather in the uk all year round is very much like the weather in california in february like a sunny day every now and then but mostly like gray clouds fog mist um rain and the also the month of february is very much people talking about love and their relationships and just being very like public and forthcoming about like coupliness and love and stuff and like feeling like that is constantly being pushed in your face and like always on your mind and always present I could see like that feeling like you were stuck in an endless February like constantly pining um and having like Valentine's Day shoved at you um and not being able to really do anything about it but like wait for it to pass but like it's endless and so it doesn't pass i took the miracle move on drug the effects were temporary this makes me think of a rebound one it very much contributed into the like madhouse psych ward vibe that she's trying to like kind of infuse into this i really feel like stepford wives is the perfect phrase because it's the 
suburban, serene, American dream. Everything is smooth, everything is shiny, everyone is going about their very clean, perfect, nice lives, but like the madness and psychosis lying underneath. Um, the behind closed doors, the breaking down that's going in, going on in the wife's head while she's sitting there cooking dinner. It's like that vibe. And so I feel like I took the miracle move on drug. The effects were temporary. That like kind of clicks into that. But it also makes me think of a rebound because people say like, oh, well, the best way to move on, the best way to get over someone is to get on top of someone else. Um, but it doesn't always tend to last for that long. Like you'll be caught up in that, but eventually like you will drop off into your state of depression and grief again because you didn't actually allow yourself to process that. And so that's that's what that reminds me of. Um, there's also in this um, verse, like right after that line, there's like a little bike bell, like a little like ding, ding. Um, and I just feel like there's a lot, there's so many like little suburban sounds going on throughout this. It has a very like smooth atmospheric chill um vibe very much like the pacing of like a nice suburban area but there's also like the sounds um of that that you just kind of hear through your window on a sunny day like kind of going on um in the background so there's like a little bike chime and then I love you it's ruining my life and I love so she says that and then he it's like a call and response she says I love you it's ruining my life and then it's like from his house over there um he's like I love you it's ruining my life but like they both don't know they don't seem to know um that like the other one is like pining from the house next door and that's kind of like a call and response again I touched you for only a fortnight fortnight is an English term I feel like that's kind of like been beat over the head from the time we saw the lyrics but there are a lot of English terms infused throughout this album um I feel like we all kind of can see why like she's been she's been in the UK and she's been like seeing English people for a long time and so that's definitely become a part of her vocabulary and they have words for things that we don't really use um and phrases that we don't really have phrases um for so she definitely uses a lot of those throughout this album the way she says I touched you I feel like that's also kind of a double entendre like I touched you like physically um like in a sexual way but also like I like this affected me um I you like touched me like internally and I feel like that I touched you for only a fortnight I touched you but I touched you something being so close and you physically being like so present and like there and like as physically close to someone as you could possibly be and then someone is so incredibly out of reach like so terribly not a possibility and yet they're like right there um and you were so close but now it's just so incredibly not <laughs> I also think that and the like forever running to you like there's like a permanence like I touched you we were close this was very real and then that's completely obliterated by like all of the space that's created by all of the other lines about like not having anything that you're allowed to talk about with the weather and seeing each other at the mailbox um and just like all of this like distance and formality so, so now we have another line that really, really, really befuddled me in the next verse. And I thought it was, sometimes come and tug my sweater. And I was like, okay, so this is like a way he like finds to like signal her and like give a little like cute hello. Um, or it's like a, a cardigan connection, like a little, little Maddie hint, or it just sounds like cute. Like it's a cute little thing, like while you're um like walking by someone to just do like a little tug on their like cardigan or whatever and like she wears sweaters she likes cozy things she is known to be a cozy girl um but then I watched the lyric video when I was listening to it and I realized that it's sometimes comment on my sweater so like it's kind of all three of those still work like is it just like a little way to send a signal is it a like a cardigan like connection or is it just like she's a cozy person um and he knows that and so like she um notices him like he makes a comment on that because it's a very casual innocent thing but like 
he knows that she likes her sweaters or maybe it's his sweater but if it was his sweater I feel like that's very 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 risky um so it's probably her sweater that's probably taking a touch too far and then the way they go back and forth back and forth on the last chorus I love you it's raining all my life I touched you for only fortunate I touched you I touched you it feels it's giving like two people sitting looking out their window and the screen is split and they're looking at the same moon seeing about their love for each other wondering if the other person has thought of them for a fortnight and that's even more like solidified thought of calling you but you won't pick up another fortnight lost in America and is it that he thinks her husband might pick up and like that would be a problem or that she literally like won't want to talk to him like she, he doesn't think that she would want to connect and talk um and that like she's good continuing her life because again like he doesn't know that her husband is cheating she says that um and then she says I want to kill him um which like she wants to kill the wife and her husband who's left the two of them to be together but like it feels like the distance created by the not knowing where the other person is in terms of their situation and not knowing how they would react if the other one were to reach out is very prevalent in this song and I feel like I don't know exactly what happened with Taylor and Maddie's relationship back in the 1989 era um and like their you know non-relationship or whatever but I could very much see that being like this weird periphery like I don't know I feel like we learned throughout the course of this album that that was a very long um kind of will they won't they friendship um connection that had never really gone to launch um and having this like wondering from afar if the other person's thinking of you um and both doing that at the same time I feel like is a little bit of a connection to the rest of the album in terms of the forbiddenness of it and the distance of it and the wanting but here it seems like they're both ignorant of it because he says thought of calling you but you won't pick up um and it's thought of like he didn't even do it he didn't do it um because it's thought of it's not I've been and then another Fortnite lost in America I feel like that could just be like one like a reference to like them being in America and that being how they both feel or like the British person being lost in her and not understanding her or them just both being within the American dream and having their lives be really shiny and good um but feeling like lost just like everyone kind of does in America and the system that we've set up and just like not quite feeling um correct but like maybe looking like you've done everything correctly if that makes sense and then it's move to Florida buy the car you want but it won't start up till you touch me and like that's such a one she says that like Florida is where she feels like that's what how she thinks of Florida like it's where people go to escape um like their lives and just like dive into the warm party pool of Florida um and like hide there and like bury their bodies there so to speak um and it makes me think do these people live in Texas um because she mentions that in Florida and we're still just like not sure what the fuck that is um but the idea of moving to Florida like a very like idealized place and then buying the car that the person you had an affair with wanted um that's such a like kind of like weird fucked up thing because you're gonna keep that car and you're gonna have that car and you're gonna know so that's like very haunting but then but it won't start up till you touch me or till I touch you because one of these verses is his and one is hers which is just really giving like I said the like Mr. Crab um and the Krusty Crab and Spongebob at the chum bucket just like looking up and singing and being like I love you I miss you um and like not knowing that the other one <laughs> is also like crying about their situation like that's exactly what like these are giving and I absolutely love it but the idea of buying the car that she wants moving to Florida and buying the car that she wants is so incredibly haunting but then it won't start up till you touch me like that makes absolutely no sense but like the metaphor I think is that like these material things you can get them you can get the car she wanted you know um but it means nothing because it's not her um you your life isn't going to feel fulfilled that hole isn't going to feel filled by any of these material things no matter how nice you make the picture of your life look if you don't feel uh fulfilled if you don't feel like you have the love that you want then like 
it doesn't matter if you move to Florida and you buy a, like the car that anyone wants. Um, it's not really going to click in and make you feel happy and fulfilled in any permanent way because they can't touch each other. So yeah, ultimately I really feel like this was a great opener to the album in terms of its vagueness. I really don't feel like it could have gone anywhere else on the album, but somehow I feel like this was intended to be first because it sort of glosses over and does like a quick flyby of a lot of the themes that very much control and contribute to this album and connect to one another in very central ways um, in terms of just the themes and feelings that come up on this album a lot. So being made to wait or suffer or silently sitting in and putting in your time in pining and wanting in misery, infidelity and like mismatched couples and people who are with people they shouldn't be but like looking at one another and wanting to both jump shit but like not being able to, being for forgotten, neglected, misunderstood, and just like left to sit in that feeling um, and maybe like having that ruminate into feeling or looking crazy, um, escaping to Florida, um, murderous or like life or death levels of feelings, British phrasing, um, being mad or crazy, and something that was very quick and bright and magical and incredible and once in a lifetime and then over. Um, so like for a fortnight there we were forever running to you and now nothing. Um, I really feel like that's a lot, that's a lot of this album. Um, and it really is all kind of infused in here in a little bit. Even the, I can do it with the broken heart, um, like kind of like fan paradox thing. Um, I feel like that the way that is in here is in the like very shiny, nice outlook and the like, you have literally no idea, literally no concept of what is going on under the surface. Um, my husband is cheating, I wanna kill him. I'm sitting there looking out the window, seeing this bitch watering flowers. I wanna kill her because we were together for a fortnight and now I have on this sweater and I wish he could see it because he knows that I love cozy things and my husband doesn't because he doesn't understand me. Like it's just, ah, like that's, it doesn't really address the parasocialness of it all, but the underlying turmoil, um, the catacombs beneath, the pretty sparkly exterior are very much present in this song. Now that we spent three years on the first track, let's move to the second one. You guys, the beginning of this song is 1975 as fuck. I I've had this shirt for years. I listen, I'm a casual fan of the 1975, probably like within the top 10, um, but not within the top five would be the 1975. And so I've had this shirt for a long time. Um, so it's like album one. And so I thought that this was kind of like the perfect video to wear it for. Um, but the beginning of this song, even like a lot of the production of this song, but really like just like kind of the background, like different noises that are a mix of electronic and live and just kind of like feeling like you're hearing things that are random, but it's very aesthetically pleasing and it all kind of fits together in a way. It makes me wonder how like, because Jack does production for the 1975 and it's very much like a lot of the, Jack is just, him and his, Jack and his synth um, is what I think of when I think of Jack Antonoff. Like him and that synth are best friends and he can do some shit for you with that synth. Um, and he definitely does for Maddie Healy. And so it just makes me wonder like, so how did you feel taking things from your boy um, and like just completely ripping them off um, for your girl? Um, and I feel like that kind of tells you what side of the breakup he was on. I'm kidding. Um, I'm not trying to speculate about what side of the breakup Jack Antonoff is on or whatever. I don't know. I'm not their friend. So you left your typewriter at my apartment straight from the tortured poets department. So this tells us that he is a little bit more pretentious than her, um, but they've clearly had some sort of relationship where like something like that has been at her apartment. So they have like a solid, like sort of more than a one night stand um, relationship straight from the tortured poets department. I think some things I never say, like who uses typewriters anyway? So he might be a little bit more um, pretentious um, than her, but she keeps it to herself out of love because she finds it endearing. But I also find it interesting that she couldn't say that because 
the picture is painted of someone who's a very like, you know, tortured artist, very moody, very prone to breakdowns and freakouts. Um, and so I think some things I never say, it makes me think like, so why couldn't you say that? And just be like, so who uses typewriters anyway? Like what the fuck is the deal? Because it would come across as either her not understanding his pretension, his tortured poetness, or her like attacking it in some way. And that would just cause a problem. So she thinks things like that, but she never says them. I'm so curious, the phrase, the tortured poets department, I need to know, did this song come first? Did the title of the album come first? How, I'm so curious what order it all happened in and like the thought process of that because it makes sense with the very like language heavy um poetic focus of this album i feel like it makes perfect sense but then also like framing maddie healy as someone who is the epitome of the tortured artist the tortured poet and kind of like leaning into that and seeing that like that was kind of something that really helped them find solace in each other and then both being like more emotional artistic people really was a connection point but then also that was the thing that like ended le ended up leading to um their breakdown was like the torturedness of it all um and the idea of what is poetic being uh, different in some ways so so I'm just curious like how that all came together like when did she know this was the title of the album and like did this song come first or not um because I think since it's the title it makes perfect sense for it to be second and I think since what we talked about Fortnite did kind of have to be first like this isn't typewriter font but it's very like straight and clean um and Maddie is very he does wax a bit poetic he does wax a little bit emotional um and like like almost like vulgar emotional in his songs it's giving like not quite Charles Bukowski but there's there's something there. And so the idea of like the tortured poets department being how she references their relationship and like that being the title of the album just really, it very much fits. I feel like we have her, their relationship vaguely established. You're in self-sabotage mode. Sounds like a tortured poet throwing spikes down on the road. Spikes on the road, like for him, like, is it like a self, like, his specific like situation spikes or for them together and I mean both both really um because I guess if he's throwing spikes down on the road for himself then it does affect them um but I've seen this episode and still love the show I think that is such a cute line like I know all of your moods and stories this is a cycle I've seen it before and I'm still here and I still love who you are and who else decodes you? And the idea of decoding, who understands you? And how many times in this album does Taylor Swift refer to not being understood and then feeling like she found a twin or finding like a cosmic connection in someone else? Who is going to hold you like me? Who's going to hold you in like a physical touch way, but also like who's going to keep you who's going to hold you like keep you hold you together but like also like hold you down you know like in a in a good way you know how people are like you're you're supposed to hold me down but you're holding me back um like from Lizzo like hold you down in like a relationship way and like a good way if not me and then going to know you if not me who could know you if not me because how could anyone else understand your circumstances we have such similar circumstances in our lives in terms of being writers and emotional artists and not quite feeling like we fit perfectly into the celebrity scene but are yet still finding success success and connection with our fans and what we need to do with that and how we want to live our lives and function within relationships with that but also the history that they have you know as you get older and I mean like I just turned 26 like I I'm just now kind of realizing the value of someone who has known you over a period of time where you have changed because you don't have to catch that person up they already understand and you know they understand because they were there um in 2016 um like literally they have that context of you and that's really not something that you can fabricate like you can't make an old friend regardless of how you may grow apart there is something there that is very valuable especially in terms of being in a relationship with someone because you really want that person to be the one who does understand you the most and who is the closest to you and so who could know you more than someone that you've had a past in history with but also who you have such similar life circumstances and unique life circumstances with i laughed in your face and said 
you're not Dylan Thomas, I'm not Patti Smith, this ain't the Chelsea Hotel. So I find, first let's start with I laughed in your face. It's interesting and it implies that this is a disagreement. And I thought that she was disagreeing with the idea that this would work out. But now that I looked more into Dylan Thomas and Patti Smith, and now I think that she's laughing at him as he's sp throwing spikes down on the road um, in self-sabotage mode, saying, who's going to hold you like me? Who's going to know you like me? We're not Dylan Thomas and Patti Smith. Dylan Thomas was a very like drunk, tortured artist. He wrote one of the best poems of all time, Do Not Go Gently Into That Good Night. Um, if you have not heard that poem, I'm sure you have. Um, and if you haven't, go read it. Um, Rage Against the Dying of the Light. Oh. Um, but he was just a very perpetually fraught um, in a very Maddie Healy way, very ingenious writer and poet. And Patti Smith is kind of the smart, put together activist, um, the original NYC poet with a capital P, the person you think about when you think of a, a feminist New York City poet um, in a very kind of like Maya Angelou type way without being Maya Angelou. And then the Chelsea Hotel is, I actually lived in Chelsea, um, so I know exactly where this is. It's an old hotel. Um, it doesn't look as old anymore, but it's somewhere that I guess a lot of like artists and writers in New York City would live and stay and kind of go through their ups and downs as artists do. And so she says, this ain't the Chelsea Hotel. We are modern idiots. I think she's saying like, you're framing it as like such a tortured poet. You're being so dramatic and poetic about it. But like, we're two modern dumbasses um, trying to have a relationship. I'm not Patti Smith or, and you're not Dylan Thomas, this tortured icon, um, this faded place where like people live and die and come up with their, like, it's just not that deep. Like, calm down. I feel like she's saying you're like, you're making it too much. Like you need to calm down. Who's going to hold you like me? Who's going to hold you with sex, comfort, commitment, and keep you safe like me? And nobody, no fucking body. It makes it playful and less serious but also kind of like doubles down we're two idiots in love um and we're gonna be fine and because nobody is going to understand you and hold you like me nobody can understand us like us and you know that's the goddamn truth baby like it's just i don't know it makes it it gives it a familiarity and a cuteness um that i can very much see two people who have like a close relationship but also like a friendship having. You smoked then ate seven bars of chocolate, not cigarettes, we've learned. Um, and my question about the chocolate is like the little ones or like the big ones? Because the big ones, that's wild. We declared Charlie Puth should be a bigger artist. That's okay. Listen, they're hanging out and like, they're like drunk stoned and like listening to this song. You're like, yeah, you should be big. Why are we not? This is good. This is good. Like, and so like they're hanging out. I scratch your head. You fall asleep like a tattooed golden retriever. Again, like we have a little vignette seeing into the vibes of their relationship, like a tattooed golden retriever. The line where everyone realized this album was going to be about Maddie Healy, but also like the golden retriever energy boy, like, and you could totally see the like, like calmness and just like sleepiness um of just this boy like falling asleep on her and not being very sweet but then you awaken with dread pounding nails in your head and the pounding is the ing the active are the nails just going like a hangover or is he pounding nails in his head is he in self-sabotage mode again doing that that's like an interesting question that i have but i've read this one where you come undone another version of that i've seen this episode and still love the show i've seen all your stories um i've seen this cycle I know and I chose this cyclone with you because I've seen it and I know and I'm still here so then we have the chorus again where like they're having an issue and then it's getting pulled back to reminding like this isn't a tortured romance we're gonna be fine everything's gonna be fine we're two modern dumbasses who could not be held by anyone but each other because no one else is crazy enough to handle us. The production of the chorus is very 1975 as well. And then sometimes I wonder if you're going to screw this up with me is a very good thing to say at this point because now we've had two verses where things have gone been like kind of nice and kind of like picturesque and then it's kind of ended with a meltdown and then we've had to have a chorus to kind of like bring us back to the center of what's making this work.
is he going to screw this up with her? You know, all of the meltdowns and stuff that the cycles that she's memorized and stuff, is that eventually going to um, cause problems? But you told Lucy you'd kill yourself if you ever leave. And I told that to Jack about you. He felt seen. So Lucy from Boy Genius and their mutual friend, Jack Antonoff. Um, again, very like high stakes, like I will die um, if this doesn't work out. That's kind of like this whole album has very like life or death stakes. But like that is that's how you feel when things are at this point, when you think someone's the one <laughs> um, and someone's been like in your life for a long time, like it does feel very life or death. It does feel like this is like it. And I think if anyone has ever like been in that situation, then like you kind of get it. And so you don't really question it. Another line I find really interesting is that everyone we know understands why it's meant to be. And that's what's crazy is that like, that's how everyone they know feels, but then like the public reaction like that versus the public reaction of them, of everyone being like, I'm sorry, what? Like, this is unacceptable. Raise, raise the alarm, get her out of there. Like, we're suddenly taking control of this woman's life. Like, that from everyone on, we know understands why we're meant to be is crazy. And then they end it with, because we're crazy. So all of the nobody's, nobody's gonna hold you, nobody's gonna know you, nobody's gonna understand you like me, because nobody else is as crazy as the both of them for someone else. To understand them but also they're like crazy for going for this and for doing this so it's kind of like both and then she says so tell me who else is gonna know me and that is the first time and the only time that she says who else is gonna know me she is always in the rest of this song saying who else is gonna know you and convincing him this is the only time she brings it back to herself and says well, you're also the perfect person for me. Who else is going to know me? Like, who else is going to be able to handle me and makes it mutual? She doesn't say hold or anything. She just says, who else is going to know me? Because that's understanding her and that's what she didn't feel that she had from her last relationship as we like kind of later find out, but sort of, sort of already knew. And then this scene is, a, it's a little bit self-explanatory, but it's also like worth taking a moment to focus on. At dinner, you take my ring off my middle finger and put it on the one pause people put wedding rings on and that's the closest i've come pause to my heart exploding i listen i feel like we all think we know that the one is about maddie healy now um and that's that's fine and that's the closest i've come um and it's closest she's come to her heart exploding but like also like that's how you feel when you're proposed to because that is like the modern ideal of love like that's when you by society standards have gotten love like that's when things have worked out is when you get married and so that's the closest she's come to her heart exploding but that's also the closest she's ever come to like engagement and marriage and she's definitely talked about those themes and like being interested in that before but that's the closest anyone has ever actually gotten and like how sad and fucking upsetting they have been in like this long relationship and that's the closest you've come is with this guy with someone else devastating um but also really puts value on that guy who's finally actually understanding and they're with you and you feel like you are on the same page in the same place there's also towards like the last chorus um the little background vocals it's like who's gonna hold you gonna hold you gonna know you and then it's gonna troll you which is like cute and playful like you can tell they had a cute playful like real friendship like relationship and like how like how do you text with someone constantly if you don't have some sort of like a casualness and a fun um with them and you can tell you really like brought some light into her life and her psyche when she felt like she was just kind of like trapped in the doom and gloom i don't know i just think it's cute that that's kind of like thrown in there in this little like who's gonna troll you like who's gonna like have fun with you and mess with you and like have these little jokes with you and so now she says who's gonna hold you me Who's gonna know you? Me. It's much more final. It's not a question. She's not having to laugh in his face and say, this is what it is. She is just telling him um, because it's true and done and not tragic or that serious or a fight. Um, who's gonna hold you? Me. And that's that on that. And we come back to the beginning. I do find it interesting though that like it ends with a question. It doesn't end with a statement. Um, it's not resolved with me. It's who else decodes you? who, who, and then like the song kind of fades out, it doesn't end with me. Um, and I do find that interesting being that they ultimately broke up, but like, I don't know, I don't want to read too much into that. 
The tone of this song is very magic and happy and falling in love with a friend. All of the relationships that she chronicles and writes about in her work, there are these themes that you can kind of corral into each muse and you can sort of see the relationship from her point of view and how she experienced it and the ones with Maddie, the themes that we keep see coming up is the idea that they are meant to be because they can understand each other on multiple levels better than anyone else can. And that I think that's also kind of what contributed to how much the ending hurt. Like I said, like when someone's been a figure in your life for that long, like the loss of that, that connection. Yeah, that does feel like the loss of your life. I feel like one of my more like controversial or unpopular opinions is that there's a few songs I don't really love as much as I feel like I'm supposed to or as others do and My Boy Only Breaks His Favorite Toys is one of them. I like it. I like it. Don't get me wrong. It's a bop um, and the more like the earworm kind of like gets into my system the more I rock with it but the metaphor it's just one like pretty basic to me like extended metaphor and so I guess I just get bored with it um, but nonetheless I do like how it starts with her like taking in air, like taking a breath to start singing. And it's not a sigh, but with the first word being, oh, here we go again, the first word being, oh, and the first phrase being, here we go again, it kind of sounds like she's sighing. The, oh, here we go again, kind of seems like the deteriorated, I've seen this before and still love the show. Now it's, here we go again. The voice is in his head, pounding nails in his head called the rain to end our days of wild my wild boy and his wild joy the production during this first verse is like bang bang so oh here we go again bang the voices in his head bang called the rain to end bang our day to me it sounds like a doll being banged like on a table like it just sounds like something being banged and like damaged called the rain to end our days of wild rivulets to send my plastic smile so like rivulets like streams of water my plastic smile um like water ruins plastic toys like water you can't play outside when it's raining you have to come inside and like the fun's over it's like a rain day now um the sickest army doll purchased at the mall sickest has so many meetings revolting mean coolest ill in many different ways so it's that word choice i think is very interesting to everyone um but you should have seen him when he first got me that's so like you're looking at a relationship like thinking back on the honeymoon phase like no but like you should have seen him like he was a different person like I, you should have seen that person. Like, I'm not crazy to still be here um, when you're like talking to your friends about how shitty your relationship is. And the banging stops during the, but you should have seen him when you first got me, the like banging sound in the production. Cause it's like going back to a happy memory. Like she's not being like banged on the table anymore. Um, my boy only breaks his favorite toys. I'm the queen of sand castles he destroys cause it fit to write puzzle pieces in the dead of night. And there are just all of these like, toy easter eggs toy imagery kids play toy buzzwords that create like a very specific image and like a very familiar image because these are all things we interacted with as kids and like i'm queen of fan castles he destroys once your queen has come you treat her like an also ran but also like i could just picture she's queen of this Thing. And like sandcastles are delicate, like they kind of take time, but they're also very easily washed away. Like it just takes one wave. And so for her to be like, this is her thing. She's the queen um, of it. And it's like kind of delicate and easily destroyed, but like perfect and like took some work. And he just absolutely smashes it. Like that is such a image but also if she's queen then he's king and he's king of self-sabotage he doesn't feel comfortable in healthy or stable dynamics or is a commitment phobe in some way um so the puzzle pieces in the dead of night them like feeling like things are locking in and corrupt and like sleeping in the same bed every night and like having the stable relationship he saw forever so he smashed it up that was too much for him. I should have known it was a matter of time um, based on all of the kind of signs, I guess. My boy only breaks his favorite toys. There was a litany of reasons why we could have played for keeps this time. She keeps saying there are so many reasons this makes sense and everyone understands why it's 
meant to be. I know I'm just repeating myself, put me back on my shelf. And that goes back to the, oh, here we go again. Like this is not new. This isn't a conversation we've never had. Put me back on my shelf where I know I go the same place. I'm repeating myself, but also that's what dolls do when you pull the string. They say the same thing over and over again. And then that's what she says. But first pull the string and I'll give you the same excuse that he runs because he loves me, which is exactly kind of what she's saying in this song. He only breaks his favorite toys. I'm his favorite. And so that's why things are working out too well and that's too much for him. Um, and so like actually saying that he runs because he loves me is actually what she's doing with this song in saying the next line, you should have seen him when he first saw me and like she's like hanging on to that like massive amount of sureness that she saw from back then and then the interesting thing in the next chorus that she says is because I knew too much and this was right after the song where she's like who's gonna know you who decodes you better who knows you and now that's become from it being like a good thing to it being like you're too close there was danger in the heat of my touch it seems they fell apart because that ignited them both but like terrified him as well. And that terror kind of won out. Once I fix me, he's gonna miss me. Telling herself that like, once she's shiny again, that he'll like go back to being shiny towards her as well. And that like, he's not even putting her back together. This girl's always having to fix herself. He's not even like putting effort into like to do anything to fix the damage that he caused. There's something in there about when we played pretend when she starts talking in the later parts of the album about how like their whole relationship was a lie or for a book or a scam or I don't know, but I felt more. I felt I was there. I felt more than when we played pretend than with all of the Kens. Um, so if she's Barbie, then like the Kens are the ones she's supposed to be with, but she was with this army doll and um, there's also the line, um, in Hits Different of like, I used to switch out these Kens, I just ghost, but now like she's with her army doll, um, and she feels more. Um, she also describes herself as tortured here. She didn't really in the last one, that was kind of something that was like her man's thing, but here she is tortured and it's right after the song where he is. And then it ends with, you hurt me so much, but I'm still not better off without you. And it sounds like, like this isn't a breakup song. This is like a in the midst of feeling the pain and kind of explaining a little bit why you're staying. It's crazy, like this album does feel kind of chronological in the way that like, we really have like sort of one pre-breakup song um, before we go into the like, did you really beam me up in a cloud of sparkling dust, um, which is where we are now. And like, God, isn't that, like I picture like an alien abduction, like just like, the smoke and like dry iceness of it all, like an industrial spaceship like coming in and like kicking up all of the dust. Um, and then just to do experiments on, that's so one-sided. Like they get so much from that, like the experience and the interest and the information, but that's like painful and being like a subject and poked and prodded at. And there's a lot of knowledge on one side and not a lot of knowledge on the other. You're just kind of like this thing to them. Tell me I, was the chosen one with like the ring and like all of the love bombing, showed me this world was bigger than us and then sent me back where I came from. He made her wiser and really felt like she fit with like his tortured poet thing and like how they thought about things in this deeper way. And it seems like they had really good like mental, emotional connections and then just like dropped her. Like how hard is it to feel like you're really connected to someone and then have them just disappear? Like, does that mean that connection was real? Was it just an experiment? For a moment, I knew cosmic love. And it feels like that statement, she's like, no, I knew it was true. And she sounds very much like she says in this later, like uh, a abduction victim that was like, no, I knew I was there. Now I'm down bad crying at the gym. And like, that's such, everyone loves that line. I love that line. I love that line the second I heard it. And I feel like the reason is because that is like, you're trying so hard to like pick yourself up from whatever is causing you to cry, like your depression, your breakup, whatever. But like, you are in such a shattered state that like it just hits you and comes in waves and you can't control it and you're literally at the fucking gym um like the least emotional like place 
um, just like trying to work out and like welling up and crying because it's just that overflowing and you just can't handle it. And it's just taking you wave by wave as it comes and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, I've seen like so many posts about like, so you think it was like an active, like working out, like doing a bench press or like a running and like there are tears or like, were we getting ready? Were we changing? Did we have a chance to get ourselves together? Like how gym were we when we were crying? Um, that's none of our business, but I do feel the sentiment. And I feel like a lot of us do. Everything comes out teenage petulance and the like the fuck it if I can't have us I might just not get up I might stay down um fuck it if I can't have him that's the teenage petulance that's the like all or nothing feeling that you get when you have like the worst breakup of all time and you're just like I I can't like I simply I have nothing this was my plan this was my hopes and dreams I don't and I don't even know how to connect with anyone in talking about it or expressing it because I feel like I'm the only one that was part of this partnership um that I have any connection with anymore the other person's gone and so I'm just here with all of these memories that are like all I can think of so I guess I'm just gonna say stuck like this because I don't know what else the to do like and you're like angry and sad and it's just too much and you're still being expected to continue with your life like it just yeah everything comes out like you were just the most vulnerable emotionally raw version of yourself um staring at the sky come back and pick me up like I get like the spaceship but also a depression activity um like staring at the sky and just like imagining what it would be like if they were to come back and things were to kind of go back like you just I feel like you have so many thoughts of like what if we just backed up what if we just put things back how they were did you take all my old clothes just to leave me here naked and alone that sounds so incredibly like vulnerable and like the abduction thing with like doing experiments and like taking all of her clothes and like dropping her back um in her town that seems so hollow now and they'll say she's nuts if she talks about her experience um because like things are just not the same after that but like no one will believe her and they'll think she's crazy if she says anything but also the like now I want to sell my house and set fire to all my clothes like the memories and just feeling like you are allergic to your own life um and like trying to deal with that and cope through it without like going scorched earth on like everything you own somehow because all everything you own was part of the memories that are hurting you and then this like pre-chorus line it's for a moment I knew cosmic love for a moment I was heaven struck and so it's all of these like just big cosmic larger than us things cosmic love heaven struck being beamed up but then before the like very last chorus where it like kind of repeats a couple times she says because fuck it I was in love because that's like kind of it like there is no other metaphor like that's it I was in love and like this is what this has done to me and now I am down bad the I like I lost my twin line I feel like is very that's one of the there are so many like little nuggets and pieces and like just very specific um vignettes that she sets up that I feel like come together to create such a mosaic of each of her relationships from her point of view and the like I lost my twin one was very much one from Maddie because it really set up a lot of like how she saw them as partners and like how similar they were and how she felt like they were opposite sides of the same coin I also love the waving at the ship um image um the like staring at the sky but also it kind of reminds me of um I'm so obsessed with him but he avoids me like the plague like you're staring up obsessed but they're just like zooming around like absolutely not coming down there staying away from you but doing all of these other things and you could see it and you're just like watching like uh <laughs> um I loved your hostile takeovers encounters closer and closer so from like the guilty as sin texting each other to slowly creeping towards actually being together all your indecent exposures that is indeed Maddie how dare you say that it's gasp and it seems like she like she can't say it like she starts breaking down because the next word is over I'll build you a fort on some planet where they can all understand it why don't we leave both of our own worlds and create something where people won't 
hate us or hate you so much and they can understand us together and our craziness. How dare you think it's romantic leaving me safe and stranded? How very tortured poet. Um, I don't know. That's something that just seems um, like, a, like a shitty ass tortured poet man would do um is just be like well ghosting just letting it be and having it always be a forever question how poetic like fuck you like you're being shitty is what you're doing um but like someone like that would call it poetic and then as the chorus kind of repeats a couple times there are a few lines the way she says like I lost my twin it just sounds like they're said from a distance like sounds that you would hear in the night um I love just the production of this really feeds into the alien vibes and I'm obsessed with it um this is a good song this is a good song people love this song for good reason track five the much anticipated so long London and I really like this song I feel like this song has become kind of a sleeper hit like it's usually a lot of I found it's a lot of people's like second or third favorite song if not their favorite when people have been talking about the ones that they like um so it starts with the iconic like acapella her doing like the big ben bells and I also think one it's beautiful um and kind of signifies like the beginning or the end of something because like the bells chime when like the clock strikes like a new hour there's also because the words she's using for the notes are so long london and you hear those kind of going in around as the notes of the bells chime you do hear her at one point just say done um done done over and over again and that really like each of these songs has a very specific vibe to me but none of them more so than this one um so long london to me is very cold and wet and gray and exhaustion and ache and just all of the feelings that you get from being weathered over a long period of time like the constant pounding of snow and sleet and rain and pressure and the unrelentingness of it and the moments of sun and dryness but never enough to fully actually cause the wet and the cold to go away and like the struggle and like the holding of something so tight that your knuckles are white and your fingers are numb that's very much the feeling of this song and the backing track has this very like continuous it's just this constant beat until um like this like slow sad piano is added around like the bridge there's this it's just like this unrelenting but like resigned beat i saw in my mind fairy lights through the mist there are so many just like english words and the song in fairy lights is the first one of them um the uk weather is very like misty and dark um but also the mist being like the turmoil um and like seeing a light at the end of the tunnel but like she saw them through the mist in her mind they weren't actually there it was hope it was a hallucination so she was like moving through the mist um towards these fairy lights that she saw in her head that weren't actually there I kept calm and carried the weight of the rift keep calm and carry on um is a very like stoic british saying um that was like propaganda during the war of like keep calm and carry on because we are strong and we are british and that is what we do and carried the weight of the rift the impact of the differences between them carried the weight emotionally of the space between them and the rift between her being from the US and him being from the UK and like her shouldering that burden by moving pulled him in tighter each time he was drifting away so like closing that rift that line also pulled him each in tighter each time comma he was drifting away period works and pulled him in tighter each time period he was drifting away period um both kind of work and so I think that's very interesting like he was drifting away and she kept pulling him in tighter regardless like that is the sentiment and so it keeps it kind of gives you this image of someone like carrying someone else on their back and like pulling them up tighter and like trying to keep them there and like someone else like drifting away across water and then like trying your best to like reel them back in but they just like keep drifting and drifting my spine split from carrying us up the hill again she's carrying it she's like under this weight and her spine your spine is like the core of you it's like what holds you up like 
physically. This isn't even like emotional. Like this is like physical, visceral pain. Um, and it's up the hill. It's never, it's not just like a straight wet through my clothes. So the mist, um, that she's constantly walking through weary bones caught the chill. Um, and the work and the sweat too could probably be making you wet through your clothes. Weary bones caught the chill. That's like being ill, but also like a very deep, deep exhaustion. Like this is like someone who is like on the brink of death in so many ways. Stop trying to make him laugh. Stop trying to drill the safe. So like drill the safe, like crack the code and like force your way through. Um, another word for that could be decoding, um, which it seems that she had no problem doing with someone else. And like, she was trying to decode this, but like there were no clues. She says later, you swear they love me, but where were the clues? Like she felt like he was a person who was giving her something verbally, but like, was otherwise a safe like there was nothing to see there was just the pieces of information that he spat out towards her that she could either believe with like seemingly no proof or not um and if she didn't there was no way for her to like crack in to get him to be more vulnerable with her thinking how much sad did you think i had did you think i had in me like you really thought i could continue on in this misery forever. I could glare at you with storms in my eyes forever. And you could just continue to do nothing about it. And I would what? Stay? Like, oh, the tragedy. So long, London. You'll find someone. Um, tragedy, tragedy is giving tragedy and comedy of Shakespeare, to be honest. So long, London. The way she uses the word London as like his name, but also like she's referring to Joe. Joe is London, but also she's saying goodbye to the place. Um, you'll find someone, and I talked about this in my initial reaction video, the phrase you'll find someone, I'll find someone is so, the song is just so bleak and painful and like this big like, this has been beaten until its last breath, there is nothing left. Um, emptiness and you'll find someone seems like that's so final like that is something you say when you're like I thought it was me and I wanted it to be me and I did everything everything that I had for it to be me but it's clearly not because I have nothing else to give so you'll find someone but but it's not it's not me. And I feel like the saying you'll find someone is indicative of the fact that you wanted it to be you because you believe that there will be someone. You believe that they're a quality enough person, but you just couldn't make it work with you. And then her saying, I'll find someone in a couple verses later, she doesn't know where she's going either. She is saying, I'll find someone, but it's definitely, definitely not you. I really wanted it to be you but it simply clearly can't be. I didn't opt in to be your odd man out. I love this line and I love the idea of like choosing someone just to be forgotten by them, just to be put on a shelf by them. And I feel like that has come up um, a lot in this album as we've talked about in this video. The idea of I was supposed to be sent away but they forgot to come and get me being forgotten and like there and like so present but not remembered and not acknowledged. I founded the club she's heard great things about. So other people think what I did is great. Other people think I'm great. Um, I don't know who she is, um, but it's certainly someone that Mr. London knows and she thinks great things about what Taylor Swift has done and whether that's what she's made him and like the fan club that's been created for him based on him dating her or just in terms of like you are looking over here at this girl and you know what she thinks I'm great I'm great everyone seems to think I'm great but you <laughs> um is kind of what that line is giving me I left all I knew literally like left like the country and all the people she grew up in to live in the house by the heath where he left her with him even if she ended things he left her emotionally because there was nothing there for her 
to leave and she couldn't live with nothing. She stopped CPR after all. It's no use. The spirit was gone. There was nothing there to leave because he had just completely gone from her. And so she may have left physically, but he did actually leave her, which is why in the two graves, one gun, he was the one with the gun. He killed their relationship and her, the both of them. Also kills me, like I stopped CPR after all, it's no use. Obviously like the heartbeat with you're losing me. And I think the heartbeat, it was her heartbeat. And it was also the heartbeat of their relationship. And I feel like Taylor Swift, of all people, would understand the like, you know, you have your heart, but then when you're in a relationship, that relationship kind of becomes part of your heart too. And so that's what was being done CPR on, like on her and also like the heart of them together. And the spirit of it was gone. The, not just the pulse, but the soul and the lifeblood of them was gone. We would never come to and I'm pissed off you let me give you all that youth for free um and I love that she acknowledges the people talk about like this album and female rage and it's not like she's like screaming and like yelling in like all of these songs but she's making very clear comments about being upset about things and things pissing her off and making her angry and like I love that um because I feel like that's not something that we are provided a lot of in the media without it being like framed is this like mm, like she's going a little crazy um type thing um and that is like sprinkled a little bit into this album but it's in a self-aware kind of ironic way because she knows that she's like kind of portraying herself as like guess maybe I am um crazy who's afraid of little old me you know it has a very like no one likes a mad woman you made her like that um vibe to it so it kind of when you have that song over there it makes it okay for her to say in this song I'm pissed off you let me give you all that youth for free and I'm mad as hell because I love this place and like actually incorporating the anger stage of grief I really 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 love that she does that because she has the sad she really does but she has these flashes of the bitterness too and she's not afraid to shy away from that and show that because it makes absolute sense i'm pissed off you let me give you all that youth for free every 30 year old woman who was left by a man who took up six plus years of her 20s because she just wasn't the one or he wasn't ready to settle down how relatable is that like and I just wrote after that line, knowing damn well you weren't gonna marry me, dot, 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 even with paper rings. I, oh God, I, this song is so good. And like people, it's kind of been said, but like, it feels like this is the only Joe song on the record because it's the only one that's needed. Everything else has kind of been said. And this is, this is it. <laughs> like every emotion that was present in that relationship has either kind of already been filtered through or it's tied up in a little like final like cry here. I love the for so long London. I am just obsessed with and I'm pissed off you let me give you all that youth for free and I'm mad as hell because I love this place for so long London. Uh, it, it's so good. Um, just the wordplay and the way even the phrase so on London is used in this is gorgeous with like it being a name and then the so long the phrase and then so long like the time stitches undone stitches that sewed them together with an invisible golden string undone I also find it interesting that in love of my life she mentions we embroidered the memories of the time we were away stitching we were just kids babe um and like I don't know I think that is kind of something that she thinks about with relationships like the invisible string idea but also maybe like stitching things together um but in that song I think of them as like crafting together and talking and like becoming close this stitches undone I really feel like that's like the idea of the invisible string um that tied them together um is no longer and like all of the things that they created that made them a couple and one are being ripped out one by one you say i abandoned the ship but i was going down with it my white knuckle dying grip this is all so painful and like really like 
last last legs like last moments of someone being able to survive and like she really bears down on that idea with the language and it's so that like he just didn't see it because he said well you abandoned the ship and she's like I was going down with it I was carrying us up the hill carrying the weight of the rift my spine splitting wet through my clothes from the rain and the mist and the sweat and the exhaustion and you're saying oh you abandoned the ship I also notice you can really hear her breathing throughout this entire song you can hear every inhale and every exhale and it really adds to the feeling of labor and exhaustion um and like in some songs that could be like sensual and sexy but like here it just feels laborious um and I feel like that that's another good word for how this song feels it feels belabored and like listening to the song isn't belabored listening to the song is a really great experience but the situation she's describing sounds so prolongedly dire and so belabored for so long that it just absolutely had to disintegrate and then her white knuckle dying grip is holding on to what his quiet resentment because that's all he gave her quiet treason some could say and so like there's no even real communication coming from his side it's just quiet resentment like in tolerate it that sounds exactly like tolerate it quiet resentment is how i would describe tolerate it um the song and we all we wondered and now i feel like we don't have to wonder anymore <laughs> now another line that i find to be a real kicker is and my friends say it isn't right and the way the lines line up with the beat, the way she says it is, and my friends say it isn't right, beat, to be scared, beat, every day of a love affair, every breath feels like rare stare. And so just the phrase, and my friends say it isn't right, like that is, that's a statement, not even it isn't fair, it's it isn't right. Like this is, that's a very severe pointed thing to say. I feel like you only say that to a friend when you are like, you are in a situation that is at a detriment to you, period, and I think you need to get out. That is what you mean when you say it isn't right. Not, it's not fair. Oh, that sucks. If you say it isn't right, I feel like you, you're not fucking around, um, at least in my experience. And then it isn't right to be scared. Like how sad. Every day of a love affair. Like, this is just not what she's describing. The word love affair even seems so out of place in this song. Every breath feels like rarest air. She feels suffocated and every time something is okay or there's like a glimmer of sun with them, that feels like a breath. And you're not sure if he wants to be there and you moved there for this guy. Fuck. The crazy thing about this song is that like, there's so much to analyze, but not like Fortnite. Fortnite is, it's themed and vague, but this is so specific. And so like, this is what happened in such a poetic, clever way. It's really like all the feelings of the end of this partnership packed into one and it's packed so tightly and beautifully. <laughs> the thing is, is that like, she talks so much about how much damage this is causing to her. How much, how, just how low did you think I would go before I'd self implode? Like that doesn't only damage him, but that's like an entire like exploding of yourself from inside out. Like that's not even just emotional with a relationship. That's like, within yourself having a full breakdown. You swore that you loved me, but where were the clues? All I had were words. Your actions did not match them. Just like in Cornelia Street, he did not call and show her hand before she packed her things and left Cornelia Street because she thought she was being let on. Um, he wasn't good about that. He never got better about it. I died on the altar waiting for the proof. You sacrificed us to the gods of your bluest days. So a sacrificial altar, and a wedding altar. So she was waiting there ready to get married, but instead he sacrificed them. You let your worst thoughts and fears and the worst version of you, your bluest days, control our entire relationship and the entire existence of us. A moment of warm sun, of daylight, might you say, of golden light. So they had a moment of that, but the rest was 
this and she kept trying to see through the mist the lights um and the daylight but it just wasn't enough. we moved to another icon um a taylor swift classic um an instant taylor swift classic if you will but daddy i love him i forget how the west was won i forget if this was ever fun i i forget how the west was won is such a like bored girly sitting at her desk in the south like I this first verse to me I forget how the west was won I forget if this was ever fun I just learned these people only raise you to cage you Sarah's and Hannah's in their Sunday best clutching the pearl sign what a mess I just learned these people try and save you because they hate you it's giving like a uh, young southern girly who's like realized how snaky and disingenuous all of the people around her are and like the people who preach and preach about how holier than thou they are but can't listen to the words in their own bible and are just like i don't remember if i ever fit in here i don't remember if i ever really liked this i don't remember all of the things that were once um supposed to be important like how the west was won and how we where we are came to be and whatever um she's just like i forgive this was ever fun but also when she says i forgive this was ever fun don't we all wonder if she means being famous i just learned these people only raise you to cage you like an animal like people only raise you to cage you so that in implies the adults in your life um as you are a child and so that kind of sets up the framework of this being called but daddy i love him um her like being seen as this like petulant child but these people parents and elders and whoever else only raise children to make them what they want to be and to fit them into a specific cage um or fans only support you in order to have you continue to serve them and do what they want there's a lot of holier than thou like religious imagery here and there's a lot of the just the very concept of someone acting holier than thou but not being able to follow the rules set forth in their own bible that they are just constantly preaching about so like completely throwing the whole thing to the wind and being like you know what I don't care what you think um it's and that's okay um because I simply could never rise to your standards anyway um and so you know what that's fine um that's very much like a thread in here and i feel like that is kind of presented in the first verse with the sunday best and even just the image of like pearl clutching like the <gasps> the scandal like that is just so clearly set up the very like Jane Austen Scarlet Letter era of it all um it's giving it's giving easy a a little bit if you've seen that um movie I feel like Amanda Bynes um character is the Sarah's and Hannah and Olive Pendergast is Taylor Swift um which is perfect because that's one of Taylor Swift's besties and one of my fave girlies as well Emma Stone too high a horse for a simple girl to rise above it a young precocious simple girl um slamming the door yelling but daddy i love him again like they're just such like the language is so specific in this song and creates such a vibe and it's a vibe that i'm obsessed with and i think we all are because don't we all want to be in a white dress with the buttons undone running through a field towards the love of our life just like hauling ass for the romance of it all like don't isn't that our dream since we all saw Pride and Prejudice like and even without seeing Pride and Prejudice wasn't that in there um in every little girl's heart so I feel like not only the like running with my dress unbuttoned but it really starts with the I forget if this was ever fun I'm a simple girl um they slammed the door like these are all this is the young you belong with me Taylor um the teenager Taylor that we haven't seen in so long who's coming back out to yell at us um and i'm so excited to be yelled at by her my whole world this boy was my whole world and he was the one thing i wanted i have given you so much um i have been a dutiful daughter and like went out along with all of the plans and done everything that you wanted and this was the one thing i wanted and you slam the door on it these people are on too high a horse like their horse is so high that like she could not rise to meet it if it was possible um and so she is forced to she can't go high because they're just too high and so she's got to go low and say you know what Fuck them, um, which is what she does. And I 
love that. So now she is running with her dress unbuttoned, screaming, but daddy, I love him. And she's having his baby. Nope, she's not. Um, she's not going that far. But did you see your face? Did you see how crazy and scandalized you were by that? Check yourself. Check yourself and how much you care about other people's lives and their decisions, maybe. <laughs> the chorus, and it's so clever. And then she goes right back to saying, and I'm telling him to floor it through the fences. There's this very like, our love is a car um, metaphor here. Then right back to the Jane Austen, I'm not coming to my senses. Um, that's such a, I feel like in every classic love story, it's a, oh, she'll come to her senses. She'll marry the right boy or whatever. Um, and she's like, no, um, I will not be doing that. I know he's crazy. She calls them crazy a lot in the tortured poets department. Um, but he's the one confirmed. Um, I want, um, and the way she says, but he's the one pause I want is really what made me go. So we've lost the one Hailers. The Hailer actually, I can't talk about this in this video, but let's talk about how the Hailers world has been absolutely rocked by this album. Um, I, I can't make a video about that, but if you know, you know. Dutiful daughter, all my plans were laid, tendrils tucked into a woven braid. She's all done up and restrained. Everything is laid out nicely and her tendrils are not hanging out. They are tucked into a woven braid, kind of like Evermore, perhaps. Um, and growing up precocious sometimes means not growing up at all. Growing up with a mind that is faster than your age and having big thoughts and plans and goals sometimes means that you never really grow out of who you were when you were a kid. You're still that person. And he was the opposite of what she just said she was. He was chaos. He was revelry, bedroom eyes like a remedy. Healing an illness, perhaps, from being sick um, and having your bones chilled. Soon the elders. I love the I love that she calls like all the people judging her and like low-key like the Swifties the elders. Like it's such a sarcastic, like fake sense um of importance to these people down at the city hall and then i just circled it and i put twitter and it's so taylor swift to like frame this all i like that she didn't do high school i like that she went scarlet letter with it um because i think it's perfect stay away from her that's literally what people were saying that's literally what people were saying on the internet the saboteurs we are the saboteurs because we were sabotaging their relationship with all our fucking chit chatting we screamed and yelled but we also thrived off of the drama of it all because we protested too much um if you know the phrase the lady doth protest too much it's a shitty way of saying like mm, she's pushing too hard, which means I think she actually wants the opposite. I think something else is going on here. I think we're being lied to. And so the saboteurs protested too much, um, was like, they made way bigger a deal out of it than like it actually was, which meant somehow that like, I think you were getting some entertainment out of this. Like, don't lie, sweetie. Lord knows we never heard just screeching tires of true love. It's funny, she, like snaps back her own little religious things. She says, Lord knows the words we never heard and God save the most judgmental creeps, sanctimoniously performing solilo soliloquies. You ain't gotta pray for me. She knows her Bible. She knows what she's saying and she's engaging with it. And she's saying, I'm good. Um, This is how I see things and you can do your thing. I'll be over here. And she's like, you want to be holier than thou? I know the Lord. Um, and I know he knows. We didn't hear none of those words. We just heard the screeching tires of true love, which like, what a line. The screeching tires of true love. I don't know the idea, but love and car metaphor has always kind of been a sexy thing for writers to play with. Um, but the screeching tires of true love line is a new one, which I really, really like. But also the idea of like love drowning out everything else. And now I'm running with my dress unbuttoned, screaming, but daddy, I love him. I'll tell you something right now. I'd rather burn my whole life down than listen to one more second of all this bitching and moaning. I love that she gets like so like forthright and is like, okay, so you're going to like sanctimoniously like all of these perfectly worded things and like write letters and everything. She's like, I am so done with all of this fucking bitching and moaning. That's what this is. Like you can dress it up and you can make it all pretty and whatever and make it sanctimonious but like this is bitching and moaning and complaining about something you have nothing no business over and like I can't do it um and I'd rather give this all up 
then let y'all and your opinions ruin my life and give up control of my own decisions in terms of my personal life. And on that note, my good name is for me to disgrace, not anyone else. Um, it has to do with me and my actions. So all of you snakes, which let's turn around, you absolutely are. Um, I love that she's out here calling other people snakes. I get to say that you're being empathetic by saying, oh, you want the best for me and you really care because you simply don't know. Um, and I am doing what I want and I am saying I'm happy. And it's not very empathetic of you to look at that and say, no, I would actually feel more comfortable um, if you were happy doing something else. So if you could change that, that would be great. That's not really very empathetic, is it? I'd save the most judgmental creeps who say they want what's best for me, sanctimoniously really making a show of saying what they are saying is what's right for this other person's life and like putting so much time and effort into it to the point where it's like, it's been given this level of importance to them, but she's never actually going to see it. And she feels a very real chemistry and connection with this person. And there's nothing anybody outside of them too can do about that, especially if you don't even know her. But the phrasing of it is just so Disney movie too. Thinking it can change the beat of my heart when he touches me and counteract the chemistry and undo the destiny you ain't gotta pray for me. Talking in words can't change science and destiny, so shut up. Like it just, it's giving the girl leaving her royal family to marry the commoner um, and like live in a cottage in happiness forever. Me and my wild boy and all of this wild joy, you can just see them like zooming down a country road. She uses the word um, wild for him before as well. If all you want is gray for me. The last song was gray, like So Long London was gray. My face was gray, but you wouldn't admit that we were sick. Then it's just white noise. It does not affect me. I can't even hear it because if that's what you want for me, then like it doesn't, your opinion doesn't matter. If that's like what you want my life to look like, then like what you have to say doesn't really matter because you want me to be miserable. A lot of people in this town that I don't actually agree with, um, but I bestow upon them my fakest smiles and am diplomatic and nice. Scandal does funny things to pride um, because it like messes, you know, pride has to do with like how other people see you and your reputation. And so scandal really messes with how other people see you and can mess with your pride and shake it, but brings lovers, the two people at the center of that scandal closer because it's like a trauma bond. <laughs> they came back when the heat died down, they came back to town and they went to her parents that she screamed, but daddy, I love him at. And they came around and the wine wands are still holding out, but fuck them because they don't care anymore. Not having to run anymore. She is free and dancing in the sun, not in the blue or the mist or the rain. And her daddy just loves him. And she is his lady, um, which is very cute and like proper. And oh my God, you should see your faces. It's still a scandal. But doesn't time give some perspective that this really isn't that big of a deal? And in fact, now that you're interested in coming to the wedding, now that this is all okay, no, you can't because you were a dick and you were judgy um, for no good reason. And now we're here and things are okay, but you were still judgy. So like, no, you're not coming to the wedding now that you're supportive and you feel bad. Um, which like at all of us, once we heard this album, literally, like literally don't you realize how stupid this was. And I also think the like, I'm having his baby line could be a reference to and the like you should see your faces it's really like anything anytime we take anything and blow it out of proportion we'll see something and be like oh she's having a baby she's oh, she's this she's that and like no um that's that's not it but we've like taken it and like blown it up into that and I feel like this song and album drop like she's saying oh my god like you should see your faces at like everything she does because we have absolutely no idea what's going on and no context or true insider or idea into anything we just like observe the things that she puts out in her art and she's a full person with like a full life and so much more going on and so like we're just kind of these little spectators and noise to her because at the end of the day we really don't even know like the quarter of it like it's just not relevant to her because it's just so 
<laughs> out of nowhere, you know, in terms of our perspective. Now that we're not in the middle of the ratty scandal anymore, doesn't time give some perspective? Um, and if we feel bad about it now, um, no, <laughs> you don't get to like come to the wedding and like be all supportive now, um, which like fair. Taylor Swift calls them as she sees them. Um, and I love her for that. I respect it. So. Now, pretty baby, I'm running back home to you. How like this song, I just wrote at the top of this song. This is a very, with two R's, hot, sexy, sweaty sounding song with the guitar and like the light strumming. It's giving a hot, humid Florida night. Um, and like, that's what I think of when I think of this song, which is funny considering what the next song is. But now, pretty baby, I'm running back home to you fresh out the slammer I know who my first call would be to the way she just like draws that out um is just very sensual and like I don't know it's just giving like blushing and like hot and like sexy anticipation I feel like running back home she like she's calling this person home now but she also I think she's literally like leaving like so on London like leaving the UK fresh out the slammer I know who my first call will be to I literally just underlined slammer in first call and wrote jail because apparently that's what um her relationship with Joe felt like for a while um and like maybe you know maybe Joe wasn't the slammer maybe the slammer was keeping the secret um of them not being good anymore and then like you know maybe him being in a relationship and her being in a relationship and not like actually being fully broken um and now they can actually be together so maybe Joe wasn't you know the only jail. Maybe there was other things creating the jail. The way she goes, fresh out the slammer, oh, like is like very like breathy and like almost like in itself, like a sigh. Another summer taking cover, rolling thunder. So like UK, like summer storms, but also like she keeps talking about like how his mood dictated like the color of the day and her ceiling. Um, and so like I don't know like kind of like trying not to like start a fight or like trying not to like cause problems he doesn't understand me so like you're just kind of like sitting there in ugh, I hate that sitting there and just being misunderstood and having to deal with it um splintered back in winter them but also like her spine splitting um and like I don't know so long London it's just such a cold feeling I feel like maybe the breakdown happened in winter silent dinners bitter quiet resentment he was with her in dreams I feel like with guilty as sin we've already done it in my head well maybe he had already done it in his head with someone else too gray and blue and fights and tunnels um if all you want is gray for me but daddy I love him blue that is Joe's color it's blue sacrifice me to the gods of your bluest days fights and tunnels I feel like I mean like London is a city it has tunnels but I also feel like there was no like oh like going out for dinner going out for drinks like or whatever like that wasn't how they were because like Joe didn't like or want that and so the way she got around having to be like house to a car to a drop-off point to a back door to um a service elevator and then you're where you are and then back through the service elevator and then through the back entrance and then the new car and then like don't be seen you know umbrellas like when you're like getting in and out of places like that feels like yeah you're traveling just in between all these dark tunnels handcuffed to the spell I was under I just circled handcuffed and connected it back to the word jail um and like spell um it made me think of so it goes and he's her magician and he did a number on her but honestly baby who's counting and and like this whole thing um with joe and the invisible string with them being a spell um that she was under that like was unreality and now she's finally like seeing for just one hour of sunshine um again for one moment of one sun of the daylight years of labor that's again that's a word i used to describe so long london locks and ceilings locks and ceilings like limits like places that would you could things you could not get past stalemates and blocks to the things that you want and then ceilings 
um, like being inside constantly and like staring at the ceiling out of boredom. But those, but those ceilings were in the shade of how he was feeling, which seems to have been gray and blue. And so like the ceiling, that's your sky. So yeah, like the, the entire weather of your life is gray and blue, like his mood. But it's gonna be all right. The locks are unlocked. She did her time. She is free. And then we have another chorus. She is out. Now there are camera flashes, welcome bashes. We're back out in public. We're doing the tour. Get the mashes for the death in so long London. Cremate it, toss the ashes off the ledge, and we're moving on. I can picture like her and Maddie like together, like tossing the ashes of something dead off the ledge. And it just feels so like cleansing and like relieving. As I said in my letters, now that I know better, I will never lose my baby again. Now, interesting letters were there actual letters were we writing letters back and forth today um or was this just like messages in songs like short little like things that she put um in like talking about like how she wished she had been the one and like um you were the one and i think about us or are we just talking about like text honestly taylor swift would absolutely be the one to be talking about like a text conversation she had and be referencing it by saying well as i said in my letters i will never lose my baby again as in like i will never lose you again from what we had when we were younger before or this is my last relationship I will never lose the person I'm with again because you're gonna be the person I'm with um, forever. My friends tried, but I wouldn't hear it. Watch me daily disappearing for just one glimpse of his smile. My friends say it isn't right to be scared every day of a love affair when you're not sure that he wants to be there, but you're doing it all for just one moment of sunshine. And all of those nights, he kept her going with, I'm guessing just like their little interactions and like sending texts and like songs and stuff. Um, like it says he does in a couple songs. Swirled you into all my poems. So clearly there are songs about him. Um, so far, Cardigan, The One and Maroon, where I mean, like we need to go back through. It's just, who knows, you know, now. Only, only she, really. And only she has ever known, really. Now we're at the starting line. I did my time. The starting line's clearly there like band. And now in the final chorus, it's now pretty baby, I'm running, not back home, but to the house where you still wait up and that porch light gleams because there isn't nobody home. And she'll pace in her pen. It is where you still wait up and that porch light gleams. I've also been thinking about the song Peter um, recently. Weird, I know, um, because he was thinking about that song. Honestly, if you're thinking about Robin, that's, that's when I have questions. There is a porch light moment in Peter. And I don't know, I've just, that song has kind of been going through itself on the back burner. And it makes me, I, I wonder if Maddie's Peter, um, essentially, is my my thing. Um, Cause he left the light on for her. And now that she's given up on him, she's turning out the porch light. I don't know, I think there might be something there. I think there might be something there. Let me know if you're picking up what I'm putting down. <laughs> and he says, she's the girl of his American dreams. Um, which is where she is back now. And no matter what she's done, it wouldn't matter anyway because he doesn't judge her. Um, and then ain't no way I'm gonna screw up now that I know what's at stake. The love of her life, perhaps? Her best friend, her twin, here, where she feels home and comfortable. I don't know, there's like a weight to that here. At the park where we used to sit on children's swings. I don't know, that's giving such a like, we were just kids, babe. Wearing imaginary rings, it's gonna be all right, I did my time. Those last few lines, like it feels like here is like this landing, like that's where she is now. Like she's been singing this song and she's like, I'm coming back home to you, I'm gonna make my first call. And then she's like, I'm here at the park where we used to sit on children's swings. And she's like kind of sitting in the happy memories of them in their past wearing imaginary rings, thinking about how they thought they would end up together. And now they are, and she says, it's gonna be all right. I did my time. And she's like looking forward um, in a really kind of like at peace, anticipatory way. Send someone be anticipatory and at peace at the same time? I don't know. Okay, so I feel like this song, I feel like I was the only one that wasn't let down by Florida. I feel like people are 
imposing upon this song. I feel like it's just like Slut. I feel like I was the only one that liked that song too because it wasn't what we expected it to be, but people are imposing what they expected it to be upon the song and holding it to those standards. And so then when it's not what they imagined in their head, they're like, it sucks. It doesn't suck. Slut doesn't suck either. Slut is a great song. Um, and I think Florida is a good song too. It's just not like this super, it's not this party hard, um, we can't stop anthem. People I think are too hard on this song, I guess is my thing. Um, and I don't think this song was supposed to be all that serious and people really built it up in their heads. So you can beat the heat if you beat the charges too. I feel like that's how, so she described that that's how she sees Florida, like based on seeing, she watches like Dateline all of the time and like people will escape to Florida and like go bury their bodies in Florida um, and like go like hide out from their crimes in Florida and the whole like Lana with like the Florida kilos and like just all of the crime and nefariousness that's going on in Florida. She sees that as you can beat the heat if you beat the charges too. Like this is a great place for you to be if you can figure out how to get back. They said I was a cheat. I guess it must be true. All these people are shit talking about me. I don't know what the fuck I'm even supposed to do about it. And my friends smell like weed or little babies. They're too busy with partying or with being parents and adults do commiserate with me and the city reeks of driving myself crazy. This entire place is chock full of memories that are killing me. And little did you know that your home's really only a town you're just a guest in. It's, it's such a weird line, right? And it's weird that it's the center point of this song, right? It's very like deep, but it's not because like everyone dies. Everyone is a guest on this earth, like really, truly, like you are a guest in every sense of the word. Like you are not permanent and you can go and you can be, you can pick up and leave and burn all your files, desert all your past lives and go and be a guest anywhere. Um, and you might not think of yourself that way, but really, truly, you're a guest in your own home too. So you work your life away just to pay for a timeshare down in Destin. So you are not permanent. You are not really truly connected to where you are. And so you work your life away to pay for an escape, to pay for the drug of Florida. Okay, that's what she's saying. It's not, re maybe really we're not supposed to read into your home's really only a town you're just a guest in. Maybe it's that you feel, but it says little did you know. Um, and so it's like maybe you thought that you were going to build this home and you were going to feel secure and like you belonged in it, but really you don't. You feel like a guest in your own life. And so you work your life away so that you can have the escape, the drug of Florida. And she says it's one hell of a drug and she is in the mood to use it up. Oh, I love Florence's verse in this song. I never get tired of it. And she kills it vocally. A hurricane with my name when it came. I got drunk and I dared it to wash me away. Florida is just ridden with hurricanes. There's like literally like a hurricane season in Florida. It happens. It's a thing. If you're from that area, you know. I got drunk and I dared it to wash me away. So it had her name on it and she barricaded in the bathroom with a bottle of wine. Well, her and her ghost, they had a hell of a time. So she coped with this hurricane by going to Florida and getting drunk and daring her demons to take her down and just vicing herself through the pain at all. Yes, I'm haunted, but I'm feeling just fine because we're coping and we're numbing and we're surrounded by all of these other girls who have their lace and their crimes all different manners of sins and they're all there together taking the drug of florida trying to escape it and trying to vice themselves through their pain and your cheating husband disappeared well no one asks any questions here babe i this is such a good time this is a good time. This is like a 1989-ified version of No Body, No Crime. So I did my best to lay to rest all of the bodies that have ever been on my body. And in, the mi and in my mind, they sink into a swamp. Is that a bad thing to say in a song? So I do my best to forget all of the people that I have gotten intertwined with physically and emotionally that have fucked me up that I just absolutely want to kill and throw into the swamp and see them sink away forever. And I try to lay those things to rest and scratch them out 
of my mind and think about not wanting to do that to them. Is that a bad thing to admit in the song? Is that incriminating? I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting way to do it though. Um, like the tone of this song and that line just, it's it all fits together in a very weird, 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 weird way. And I'm not sure it all fits together perfectly, but I'm vibing to it. And then we go into little did you know your home's really only the town you'll get arrested. And not only like the crime way, like if you stick around to get caught, um, but also like your home is where people know you well enough to get you in trouble. Um, and also arrested is in like arrested development, like your home is the place that you will be held back um, and you will be kept from reaching your full potential and stunted. So you pack your life away just to wait out the shit storm back in Texas. So and I'm guessing, I'm guessing Texas doesn't actually have a high significance. I think it might actually just be like where all the rich people who vacation in Florida are from. I think the song is like less deep than anyone wants it to be. It's just kind of a little bit of a time, um, but it's a good time her and Florence had and I'm having a good time with them. Tell me I'm despicable, say it's unforgivable. This is like the masochism of like your pain. Like get it all out now, say what you need to say because I can't take this anymore. If you have anything else to say, please let it out now while I am numb and already in pain and like trying to go through it. I need to forget, fuck me up. I've got some regrets, fuck me up. What a crush, what a rush. Um, and like, yeah, it's masochism and numbing yourself through the pain. And like, I'm already at rock bottom. I am already in so much pain. What else have you got for me, world? I'm daring you to take me down because I can't see how it could get any worse. And I am just going to go and fling myself into the vices and the parties and the pool of Florida because I simply cannot cope um, with this misery anymore. I can't do it. Love left me like this. I don't want to exist. At least that, that is so worth making it through this song for. Taylor could have said that on Reputation. Um, Taylor could have said that on Red and that would have been a Taylor Swift lyric. That is just, I heard that and I went, I'm so glad we have another Taylor Swift record. Like it's just such a Taylor lyric to me. And I feel like we think this is after the Maddie breakup that she's talking about like getting fucked up by Florida because clearly she was like so super scarred by that. Um, so yeah, I could definitely see love left me like this. I don't want to exist being that, but also like just in general being left down and out by a fucking relationship and wanting to just dive into hoeing it up, um, in a very Florida way. That's relatable as shit. Sorry. Um, if it wasn't obvious, it took, it takes a lot of time to really delve into each and every one of these songs and really give them their due and truly like analyze and go line by line and not like rush through any of them like their throwaway songs. Um, and I still feel like I did that like a little bit, just like trying to get through certain things and certain parts that I felt like everyone like kind of understood and we were on the same page about. Um, so I have decided to split this into four parts instead of the original two. I was going to do the first half of the album and the second half of the album, but but now I'm going to split each of those into two for like eight songs each because there's 16 songs on this first half of the album. So we are going to wrap things up here. Let me know your guys' opinions, your analyses, your thoughts. Um, please, please, please let me know if you guys have any conflicting or same thoughts as the ones that I have had here. These are just the thoughts of one Swifty with her little glitter gel pen. So there are definitely many, 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 many more ways that these songs and all art can be interpreted. So I would love to hear about it in the comments feel free to let me know in a kind way please and thank you so very much for being here especially if you made it all the way to the end of this video i cannot tell you from the bottom of my heart how much i appreciate you and how freaking happy i am that you are here so thank you thank you thank you and if you did like the video feel free to like it because you you watched this far you you liked it so like like it. It makes me so happy to know that you liked it. It brings me the utmost amount of joy and does a ton for me on my little trajectory here on the platform. And subscribe if you would like to see the analysis for the rest of the songs on the standard version of Tortured Poets Department, as well as the anthology, as well as all of the videos that I have coming out in the next few months. I was going to do a Met Gala video that I was actually going to film right after this, but I actually, I don't know, I actually ended up being a little bit 
let down by um, the Met Gala this year and I just have some weird bored also just kind of uncomfy feelings about it but if that's something that you guys would really really like to see let me know about that thank you so so very much for being here once again and I will see you very soon in the next one Mwah.